good afternoon and good morning to you if you're if you're further afield. Look, I'm joined this afternoon by two eminent academics who on face value look at the view, the promotion and the maintenance of peace through subtly different lenses. Um, we've got Professor Funmi Olanasakin, who is Vice President and Principal of the International and an International Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's. But she's previously worked in the office of the UN Special Envoy to the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict. And she was one of seven members of an advisory group on the review of the United Nations peace building architecture. And in 2016, she was appointed as a member of the advisory group of experts for the United Nations Progress Study on Youth, Peace and Security. So a very strong and illustrious career looking at the, the championing of, of peace, particularly through youth. Perhaps on the sort of complementary other side is Professor Christopher Coker, International Relations at the London School of Economics, two terms at the Royal Institute of uh, Royal United Services Institute. He's been a regular lecturer at the Royal College of Defence Studies in London, at the NATO Defence College in Rome, and the Centre for International Studies in Tokyo. So on face value, coming far more from the maintenance of peace through a strong and authoritative uh, defense structure. So the question is, is interesting because it almost poses a view that um, great power competition somehow went away from the Cold War um, and is now just, just returning. But let's not, let's not close on that and perhaps open up by saying that if we've had an increase in the aggressive nature of great power competition, um, what are the what are the sort of top two vectors that you think have forced that increase uh, rather than decrease to the friction? And perhaps, Professor Funmi, over to you first. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. Uh, it's a very interesting question, actually, and there, there are several ways of looking at it, but I want to deliberately focus on two things, um, one being the rise uh, of China, um, but by that rise, uh, in this case, I talk about its uh, growing influence in uh, developing nations, developing regions of the world. Uh, that influence is palpable and it stands in direct competition uh, with uh, the rest of the uh, activities of other global powers. And that, that, that's a key factor in the multipolarity we see in the world today. But the second thing that, stands, uh, that I would put at par um, with the rise of China has to do with a more confident, uh, self-confident um, generation of young people. If you like, you can call them Generation Z. Um, they're global in outlook, they're transnational in the way that they operate, and more importantly, technology enables them uh, to really, uh, really organize themselves, the ways in which they organize uh, a new form of you know, global social movement. Are fighting for social justice and can be uh, mobilized uh, so fluently, so immediately, uh, depending on the issues uh, at the core of the global or national agenda. I think this cannot be discounted. This has to be seen as one of the big um, multipolarity uh, and multipolar factors today. Uh, uh, and that, of course, they're not state actors, but you see them. Uh, and they stand shoulder to shoulder, in my view, with uh, if you like, uh, the new forms of global corporations, many of them digital actors as well. Professor Funmi, thank you. It, really interesting. I can't imagine that uh, Professor Christopher is going to demur on your first point, that, that a, a more authoritative and a more outward looking China um, has changed the strategic dynamic um, and, and potentially um, made it more more unstable rather than rather than more stable your second point on on a growing youth that generation z is is fascinating and it'd be interesting to pick whether that is a force for good or a force for destabilization but professor christopher um at the risk of, of asking you to repeat the, the 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 point on china from your point of view what are the two things that are forcing an increasing friction in 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 uh, uh global superpower confrontation well, the two forces that I would uh, identify are the, the emergence of what is called by some a post-Western world and by others a post-American world. And you started off this program with calling both China a 
and the United States superpowers. I think neither is the case. I think the United States is no longer a superpower. I think it's the, the greatest of the great powers. And I think China is on the way to becoming a superpower, but is, uh, is far from that at the moment. But what we have, because you asked me to, uh, to look at these two changes, uh, first change is a post-Western world. What do I mean by that? Well, I think a challenge to the idea of, of liberal world order, but it's a challenge to the idea that Western values are the only values uh, that, uh, that actually count. And it's interesting that in 2019, both Russia and China signed a, a joint communique uh, in which they talked about the need to uh, produce a polycentric world, uh, a multipolar world, in other words. But they also talked about a world in which there would be value pluralism, in other words, that different civilizations and societies in the world would have their own value systems, no less valid than those of, of, of the West, and that there would have to be what the Chinese call harmony with difference, and what we used to call peaceful coexistence in the Cold War era. In other words, mutual respect for each other's values. So that's the first, because that is a major challenge to the United States, which has always assumed that American exceptionalism means that it's the purveyor of Western values and that Western values will be non-Western values. The second, I think, is that war has come back into the equation. So um, if you were looking, for example, at a, a well-known book by Steven Pinker called Enlightenment Now that came out two years before the pandemic, he says very confidently there that thanks to the wonders of modern science, there will be no further pandemics. Be very careful what you predict because you're likely to find your predictions uh, explode in your face. And in this case, we're not, we're not only told that we're living in a century where pandemics would probably be as common as war and revolution were in the 20th century, but we're also, I think, looking at a world uh, in which war has come back into the equation because of new opportunities. So whether we call it hybrid warfare, which uh, the Russians did not invent in 2014 when they uh, occupied the Crimea. But anyway, it's a term that we use, whether we're looking at cyber warfare that we're very uh, cognizant of because we hear the term all the time, whether we're looking at troll factories uh, in Russia uh, that have been instrumental in trying to undermine uh, uh, democratic uh, regimes in the West, uh, uh, information warfare, it's called, uh, or whether we're even looking at space, the United States setting up for the first time a space command, which means not only the use of space, uh, which of course we've used since 1957 with satellites, but actually the use of space uh, as a domain of war, which will be in fact quite uh, uh, unprecedented. So I think for those two reasons, uh, we see a return to uh, great power competition. Christopher, that's 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 fabulous. I'm I'm going to draw Fumi into one of your points, um, and then come back to you on the on the how do we avoid your first point, which is you know U.S. is no longer a superpower. China is an aspirant superpower. How do you how do you try and defuse that potential competition? But but I want to ask Funmi to sort of draw out some points on, on your th second point, which was a challenge to Western values and a, and a value pluralism. Because to some extent, what Christopher put there um, is an opportunity to create a sort of, you know, for want of a better word, a more peaceable environment um, on the understanding that those, those two changes you describe are, are willing to move forward. And, and really, I want to draw out your second point, which is the Generation Z. How would you, or Z, how would you seek them to, to work to reduce the friction that Christopher describes of a challenge to Western values and value pluralism? Because it could be a journey to a more stable environment, um, but it could not. And I wonder whether your second point can be a force for good in that instance or or, or bad? Yeah, it, it, that's very interesting. It could be either. Um, quite honestly, and much depends on the behavior of um, more powerful actors today, those who hold the power and the privilege across the board, whether we're talking about uh, in terms of uh, how they engage and use the security apparatus or how they use economic power, political power across the board. There's contestation at this point in time. And uh, Generation Z will mediate that space uh, for good or bad. 
And now, let me, let me give an example. In, in terms, if we're talking about the value, uh, and what was it that, uh, you know, the, 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 the pluralism of values, it's at the heart of what many young people are asking uh, about globally whether they talk about, I mean, the decolonized language becomes highly contested, and it is. But when they talk about decolonizing, uh, whether the academy and all forms of institutions, they're talking about bringing all forms of knowledges to bear on an equal footing. They're talking about bringing uh, systems of power, systems of knowledge, uh, from the global south to the global north, speaking to each other. And the thing about uh, these sort of things, even in the academy, it is so difficult to ask, you know, the knowledge systems uh, or the power holders that have privilege today to give a little bit of space there. And you can apply that to the global leadership platform on any front. It cannot happen without major contestation. And some of the major contestation we're beginning to see on the issues on which people are all agreed, the things are threatening all of us at once and the environment, we're beginning to see that kind of movement. But on the things that really um, will mean that you lose status, um, look at Africa and the use of natural resources in Africa. When Africans ask, when African people ask the rest of the world, but there's a, there's a nuance to it, not just the rest of the world, there's a debate as to whether China is friendlier in that system or whether Russia is friendlier. And both countries are using vaccines at this moment to really gauge, to really, uh, to really push further their influence, China in particular. So when those young people marry their, their destinies uh, with that of China, it makes a difference. And if they don't, it also makes a difference. It will be issue by issue, there will be contestation. And I think the only way that the powers that be today can begin to mitigate, can begin to really dial down um, those contestations is if they see the good in what that generation, what this new generation is offering. And it's not easy to see it because it's a mixed bag, really. Okay, Funmi, I'm going to ask you a quick question on the back of that yes. and then come back to Christopher because I imagine that there are, you know, senior politicians listening to the two of you and there are certainly a whole host of people who in the next decade or so aspire to be politicians who are listening to you. Yes. Yes. So I want you to try and come back to me and tell me how, what advice you would give to the senior politicians in that in in those current um, those current two countries those current two powers that Christopher told us of the aspirant China and the and and, and a US and I exaggerate for effect here moving into the sunset of its of its you know the, its dwindling power. What advice would you give to those two suits, those two powers? One dwindling superpower, one aspirant superpower. That's two, to, to to exploit the strength that you've just described, because there is clearly a, an energy uh, within that generation Z. How can they how can they exploit it to reduce the threat of war rather than increase the threat? Yeah, uh, that, that's an excellent question. Really, if China, I think China is more vulnerable. To be quite honest, it's uh, it's the new emerging power, as as Christopher said. Um, and it is one that is testing new ideas in very many foreign terrains. Um, Africa just seems to have a consolidated, you know, when you think about it cumulatively, it's a very large terrain of young people uh, of a continent with a rising youth bulge. So how China behaves in that place and how it understands that what it preaches with Russia in terms of, of this, um, the, the value uh, the pluralism, has to apply even to the places where China is present. And so when you look at the use of labor, when you look at how its corporations or companies behave abroad, when you look at how they engage those spaces, what I see, and now you have to say that that's subjective because this is based on anecdotal evidence, uh, is a China sometimes that really, really is seen uh, to really align with uh, elites, with governing elites, sometimes aligning with elites who work against their people. Uh, if you're aligning with elites who are closing their social media spaces uh, and actually really also abusing the rights of the citizens, when those people rise against the governing elite, they're likely to also rise against 
that that will be the message to China. China needs to take very seriously the growing youth bulge in Africa and the fact that you have a new kind of actor, a new set of actors, next generation leaders on the continent who do not necessarily behave in the same old way. Uh, to the United States, I would say that what applies is that those next generation actors are not necessarily uh, after they're not waging, they're not being a part of traditional warfare. You would have seen since the 2000s. I worked on the question of children and armed conflict before. What you saw with the ready recruitment of children, young people as soldiers, has since changed uh, to a situation in which young people would rather also take to the streets instead of being utilized by armed groups and warlords like they were Italy before. I'm not saying that is completely over with the kind of terror networks that we have, but they, they exercise agency more, even if they're going to be part of any armed groups. And that's why you see the social movements changing with young people. And the U.S. has to be alive to that, uh, because if the U.S. is also going to create you know, strong arm uh, states in the Sahel, uh, for example, uh, because they need to prevent terror and migration. If they don't do that, cognizance of the fact that those young people too are asking questions of their leaders, the U.S. might be on the wrong side of history. We have a really new generation of people that are making different decisions. Funmi, thank you. I'm going to come back to a couple of points there, but I'm first going to go to Christopher. I have a career, as, as Suki said, which, which has been formed by um, keeping the peace uh, as a practitioner of the threat of war. And, and you and I will understand uh, and have spent our careers looking at the deterrence theory of coercion. Um, and, and that's what I understand. I understand that from the Cold War when I started my career and I see it returning now. When you look at, when you look at deterrence with these two two superpowers, and I'll use the word superpowers um, despite your, your cogent points, these two superpowers that are abutting each other and will increasingly abut each other. What deterrence, and I suppose for want of a better word, encouragement levers do you see that can be used by both of them and other players um, that, that will reduce rather than increase the threat of conflict and war, which you said is now back on the table, Christopher? Well, uh, two responses to that. Uh, first of all, uh, you could tell yourself a different story, what, what academics like to call reference narratives. And if you go back to the Cold War, both superpowers were telling themselves exactly the same story. And basically, they were on the side of history um, uh, that uh, the other system, whether it was capitalism or communism, would collapse from what... Uh, communists call the internal contradictions of the system. Uh, and therefore, all you had to do was avoid war. And if you could do that, uh, then you would, in fact, win. So it's a great thing when two uh, enemies or adversaries, shall we say, are telling each other exactly the same story, although they think it's going to have a different ending for each other. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Cold War ended without firing a shot because the Soviet Union, when it realized it was on the wrong side of history, practically gave up the ghost at that point. Well, quite literally, it, it disappeared from history in 1991 as a, as a political entity. Now, of course, how did you avoid war? How did the two superpowers avoid war? Well, of course, as you said, they were able to find a concept called deterrence. They were able to deter each other from even thinking about uh, nuclear conflict, although you will also be aware, I know that we came very near to a nuclear war twice in 1962 and 1983, so we, we got lucky. The problem with these new uh, uh, domains of war, like cyber warfare, is that it's very difficult to find uh, how deterrence can actually be applied. Because as uh, uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, the Google uh, fellow, said uh, a couple of years ago, uh, cyber attacks don't leave vapor trails. When you launch a missile from your territory, the satellite will immediately pick up the vapor trail and will tell the other country to which the missile is heading who's actually launched the attack. Uh, you have no idea who has launched a cyber attack on you. You have a pretty good idea, but it's very difficult to actually confirm it. So if you're looking at the first a cyber war, uh, to use a, a term that is contestable, uh, against Estonia in 2007. That was the, uh, the first time that an, a country that we assume was Russia attacked another country in cyberspace. 
And that actually meant that when people went to their ATM machines on the Monday morning to get their money out for the rest of the week, they found that they couldn't, their ATM machines uh, weren't working. Now, that's the, Estonia is the only country to have actually been attacked in this way. But of course, we are actually attacked with cyber attacks uh, every other day. Uh, and many of those attacks come from Russia, many attacks come from China. So it's a kind of perpetual warfare. It's what uh, uh, the Oxford uh, professor Lucas Kello calls a period of unpeace. In other words, we're living for the first time in history in an era where it's very difficult to tell the difference between war and peace. And if you can't draw that distinction, it's very difficult to deter. The other thing I'd say about cyberspace is that we've tried to find a code of behavior so that people will act responsibly even when they're attacking each other. In other words, that they will accept that there are certain red lines that can't be crossed, because if you cross them, then that cyber war is very likely to become a conventional uh, a missile war in no time at all. And um, we've just been un unable to do that. Now, in 2017, the UN Secretary General managed to broker an agreement between the United States and China to stop cyber attacks against each other. And that agreement apparently held for two years, but it's broken down. Uh, and therefore, that's why I'm concerned that in a world in which deterrence becomes weaker and weaker, uh, you can go back to that uh, familiar concept of avoiding war. Christopher, that, that I, I'm glad you closed there because I was going to ask you for a yes and no answer of whether you felt that you know going forward deterrence would be an effect, for want of a better word, that we, we could use and, and likewise our opposition could use. I'm going to ask very quickly whether, and we, they, they, it was applied um, during the Cold War as well, whether the sort of inverse of deterrence, which is you know an element of, of encouragement, I mean coercion sounds destructive, but let's call it encouragement, which is which is seeing the value of of of, of de-escalation. Can you see can you see levers there? And I then want to come on to Funmi because I think that the the populace and the group that she described are probably the opportunity for that force for good. So, for want of a better phrase, that that effect of encouragement. Can you see any opportunity for that? Well, all I'd say is that the Terence uh, works in, in, in different uh, theatres. Uh, in the Cold War, it was purely military. And that was largely because there was no economic interdependence between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. Basically, the Soviet Union was autarkic uh, and traded within its own sphere. Today, we have a completely different uh, uh, phenomenon, and that is that China and the United States are each other's largest trading partners and each other's largest markets. So a trade war between the two, which we came very near to under Donald Trump, but fell short of it, fortunately, uh, will have serious repercussions. But it also means that you can deter a country that you see as a military aggressor by threatening economic retaliation. And that wasn't possible uh, in the Cold War. So I just uh, referred to, you may remember a couple of months ago, there was a military buildup uh, on the uh, frontier of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, the Russians stationed uh, 75,000 to 100,000 soldiers. And it seemed at one point that they were getting ready for a military incursion. And uh, the President of the United States uh, rang Putin up and just said, if you do that, there's no military response that we can make, but there will be economic consequences. In other words, the, the sanctions that are already in place will become much tougher. So it's a judgment call. You have to decide what's in your interest or not. So I think deterrence still applies. Uh, you can do that in all sorts of ways, not just the economic, but the cultural, the scientific. Uh, uh, you just suspend cooperation, which might get people to think twice. But that, in a sense, works against Russia because Russia is arguably not a great power. Uh, it's, it's a regional power with a huge nuclear arsenal, but it's not a great power in the way the United States and China are. I think it's much more difficult to imagine the United States and China being able to use that weapon against each other. Having said that, of course, the American preference has been for economic, uh, the use of economic power, whether it's sanctions, uh, whether it's the weaponization of the dollar, uh, the Americans have used the economic lever in the last 10 or 15 years in order to um, empower themselves or re-empower themselves in some senses. And, and I think that leverage is probably coming to, to an end. And, and I'm going to draw you in here, Funmi. What, what Professor Christopher has described is 
is generally what you might euphemistically call the sort of the deterrent stick rather than the encouragement carrot. You know, it has been it has been both powers attempting to um, to to pressurise um, their, their 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 opposite number to do something of their behest. You seem far more positive that there is a that there is a lever marked encouragement rather than deterrence, and I'd just be intrigued as to as as to how you feel. Um, let's pick the U.S. in this instance, but you know perhaps you could mention China. The U.S. could uh, encourage China to take a more peaceable and less inflammatory approach, but both sides will will view the challenge through their own lenses. So it would be interesting to hear China's too. No, interesting. Uh, I think really it's one the two ways in which to look at deterrence um, in this case between the US and China. The US still needs to see what it has. Uh, for example, still has a lot in the area of innovation and so on, notwithstanding uh, that China you know, is rapidly mopping up, uh, whether through the front door or the back door, uh, all those areas of innovation uh, that it can use as leverage uh, on China. Uh, that's why it's about competition and cooperation, cooperating sufficiently so that you know the competition um, will not be too tense. But if you look at China and, the, and what it has in terms of volume, share numbers of people and big data uh, to really advance rapidly, uh, to test technology and so on, that's another area where you begin to see. So there's some push and pull factors between both countries. But the second point I want to make on the question of deterrence is this. Those places in the developing world where both powers still want to retain some kind of influence, even if uh, the last year's government did not see, see those places as particularly useful because we were looking inward, those places are the places where the behavior of the population will be a source of leverage. Whoever that population decides to support in terms of volumes of trade, in terms of how they behave and support the action on the ground. So we're seeing a new proxy. We're going to see proxy wars fought uh, in terms of how those countries, those two countries in particular behave abo uh, abroad. I would say Western Europe here as well, because if you look at uh, China and the Belt and Road Initiative, the fact that at the moment G7 countries are also doing, are going to build back better, it's exactly the same sort of countries outside of their own um, of nations that they're targeting, and how the populations of these countries behave will be, will be significant. And I think um, the place that probably holds uh, some kind of trump card here might be the European Union and the kinds of agreements that it signs with this part of the world, African, Caribbean, Pacific. Let's look at that and how those sort of agreements begin to uh, change the game. And I think Europe is going to be a big part of this story but how do populations of europe behave and how the populations of those other parts of the world are behave would be a significant aspect of this if you have a young african who sees china as the enemy um, the leaders will not defend china for too long and vice versa and i think this is what was not part of the equation before which can be part of the equation now if we're talking about deterrence there's a new proxy war that will go on Okay, um, I'm, we're, we're closing on question time. Um, I've sort of got a reflection over the last 30 minutes of a, and I'm going to characterize it through exaggeration. Uh, Professor Funmi, who is very upbeat, sees the youth, sees uh, cooperation as a huge force for good, but with some risks associated, particularly with the two, two great powers. And with Christ Professor Christopher, who's sitting looking at a, 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 at a, a moment in time where you've got an aspirant great power and you've got a great power um, uh, in decline um, with very different cultural views and an interconnected economy, which is both a force for good and, and a threat. Perhaps each of you could, could reflect in just sort of, you know, minute to two minutes, um, whether you think that the world has got the right structures in place to take superpower competition forward and de-stress it 
rather than accelerate and increase uh, friction? And if not, you know, what, what would you change? And um, I'm going to go first to Professor Funmi, and um, perhaps if you could tell me, you know, how would you, what structures would you change? And if you can keep it brief, because I've got questions coming in afterwards. So sorry to put you on the spot, spot there. Um, I, let me go straight to the UN Security Council where that, um, I, I should have mentioned that as well, where that competition is going to be most profound because we're going back to a time when uh, it was the Soviet Union or the US, if they didn't agree with something, things were shut down. Now it, it's the China-Russia axis and the US-Western European uh, axis. That's where I think we need a new structure for the world. What we have is not working, it's not just about new, um, you know, confident member states joining them. It's also for the first time having non-state individuals um, like you would have in uh, organizations and non person. For those kinds of non-state actors like corporations or uh, you know groups of individuals, you can really change the balance of play because they become the voice of the United Nations Security Council. That's the kind of thing. It seems far-fetched, but I do not see the UN Security Council as relevant to anything in the world these days if it does not change its purpose. Professor Funmi, a, a, a downbeat assessment of the, of the only global uh, institution we have. Um, Professor Christopher, your thoughts? Well, I'd be equally downbeat. Um, the only way of avoiding great power competition is when the two great powers can agree not to compete or when they can agree to compete uh, uh, economically or commercially rather than militarily. And there are two things, I'm, I'm afraid, standing in the way of this cooperation. One is what... Uh, but President Trump's uh, former security advisor, H.R. McMaster, in a recent book called America's Strategic Narcissism, which is that the U.S. still sees itself as the central player in all of this. You may remember when Trump's uh, ambassador to the U.N., Nikki Haley, first addressed the Security Council. She said, uh, you're either you know, not with us or against us, but um, the thing is that we are, uh, we're watching our back. And for those of us who don't have our back, we're taking names. That uh, was the kind of arrogance, um, which unfortunately is still, I think, central, centrally there in the American admi administration and the Biden administration, the American imagination. Uh, this unwillingness to share, basically, this unwillingness to accept that China is going to have a, a major voice in the running of the international system, which will, of course, ultimately mean the reform of the United Nations, which has been blocked for over 50 years. On the Chinese side, uh, there is, I think, an unwillingness to uh, to make friends, uh, partly because, as Xi Jinping told you, and uh, General Assembly, when he addressed them a couple of years ago, we're not the West. We don't have alliances. We don't have allies. Uh, we have partners, but they're partners here today and they, they, they go tomorrow. And the whole Belt and Road Initiative is, of course, a, an excellent sign of this partnership. Well, that ended in what was called wolf diplomacy, um, which is a highly aggressive and arrogant language by the Chinese in the last two years, partly fueled by COVID and the belief that the United States was, was down and out practically. In fact, it, it's not out, it's back. But Xi Jinping, of course, did say in a major foreign policy speech three weeks ago that we need friends now that we've forgotten. Well, I hope, I hope that is the case because China traditionally has not sought friends uh, at all. It has sought just merely trading partners. And I think there is a need for friends. But the downside to that, and this will be my last sentence, you'll be glad to hear, is that friends can lead to a kind of sino system, sinic system, where you have a block of countries that associate themselves with China in the same way that you already have a block of countries that associate themselves with the United States. And you saw that block of countries in action over the weekend. It's called the G7. And China said yesterday that the world's fate is not determined by a small group of Western countries. So I, I fear what's happening is that we are the world is dividing into blocks. And it's going to be very, very difficult to be neutral, uh, to be non-aligned, to use a term we're familiar with from the Cold War, because both countries demand that you make choices. Professor Christopher, thank you. I'm going to come very quickly to a question, and this is for you, Professor Thunmi. Um, and the question is, um, what, what, um, 
China is teaching the skills to the African indigenous population so they can be independent and not, not teching them so that they'll always be dependent upon China's input. I think the question is around, is China buying loyalty or is it properly developing um, the nation states, particularly in Africa, where this, 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 this questioner is from, is it developing the nation states so they can, they can be the friends that, um, um, but not the dependents that Christopher described? Mm -hmm. and, and if you could give that for a minute, I, I can then close and pass back to Suki. Thank you. Right, right. This is where I return to my um, uh, IR origins, and I don't think uh, Chris and I would disagree there. What, what state actors will always do is to act on the basis of their interests. So any African uh, nation or any ACP country that thinks that uh, China will act differently from the West before, uh, before them, uh, has something else, uh, you know, uh, coming. Uh, and I think it's simple. All China is doing, it creates a platform where it wants to build partnership and promises equal partnership. But when you have weak nations uh, unable to take advantage of that offer by making demands that work, you know, for, for their people, uh, then you have, I mean, China does not have any, does not owe Africa or Latin America or Asia, Pacific uh, countries any special favors against its own people. It will take what it can get. And if it needs to build the capacity of those people um, only to come back to ensure that the market is there because they have put the infrastructure there uh, and so on, it is acting its own, its own interest. And that's why uh, I would continue to argue that a new generation in these countries will challenge their leaders very hard uh, to change their behavior towards China or Europe or the US um, in order to to give a better opportunity to that next generation. But whoever reaches there first on a fair basis is probably going to thank win. You. Yeah. Uh, Professor Femi, uh, Professor Christopher, thank you so much. I think we've left with a feeling that you're both relatively unimpressed with the current UN Security Council and the powers it has. We've got a US that is uh, unwilling to share leadership and let's hope that that changes um, through the Generation Z that, that you described, Professor Funmi. And a China that is quite a transactional nation, and as it matures its um, its political and geopolitical um, diplomacy, one hopes that it will become more uh, developed than the very transactional approach. But to both of you, thank you very much for your time, and I now hand back to Suki for the remainder of COGEX. Goodbye. Thank you.